Good morning. Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Martin Grass. Uh, I've been caving, potholing, speleology as the technical term is, for was 53 it? years. So you're going to have to say, you have to say that again. What, what was that term? Speleology. 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 Okay. Speleology. It's a new word the study of caves. The is study it? of caves. Oh, oh. So one becomes a speleologist. Oh, right. Wow. Okay. okay. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I've been doing that for 53 years. Um, I've been a Mendi- uh, member of Mendip Cave Rescue for um, oh, probably 25 years, I suppose, 20 years. And um, I'm currently their chairman. And I'm also chairman of the Cave Diving Group, yeah, yeah. which is the national body in the UK. Oh, wow. Amazing. I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Going underground. <laughs> no, going in a cave's bad enough. Going up Cheddar Gorge and standing in those caves is bad for me. So yeah. absolutely, the thought of going underground in the dark, trying to negotiate through a little... Oh no. So you're clearly very experienced. Fairly, yeah, I would say, after those, those many years. Um, mainly in the UK, but I've done a, a bit abroad, Canada, um, so I've been Caribbean a fair bit because I used to work there okay. um, on and off on business. So I've done some caving in Jamaica, Cuba, places like that. Amazing. And what, what's, what's the best cave that you, you've kind of explored? Oh, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I would probably say the most exciting uh, time was um, Cavers Dig for Caves. That could be on the surface which as we, we get older, we tend to have surface digs because they're quite good. We've got one down in the Quantocks at the moment, okay. um, two caves side by side, not a lot of limestone. Lime, limestone's where you, you find caves. Okay. Um, you find a few in volcanic rock and a few in chalk, but 99% of the world's caves, all the big ones are in limestone. And um, so there's a little bit on the Quantocks, but the cave, we have two caves there which are, 25 foot long which we're digging which may break into bigger passage but that's good because we can it's only 25 foot so we can come out sit in the sunshine have our cup of tea and have our lunch and it's <laughs> all laid back but you might be digging in a cave um four hours in five hours in people have been known to dig at the bottom of caves when it takes 11 hours to get there yeah oh wow so you know that's we leave that for the youngsters now but back to your question I would say that um, probably the most exciting time was we were digging a cave in Cheddar Gorge called Reservoir Hole. Um, That's been known since the 60s. A very famous local person who's sadly passed away now called Dr. Willie Stanton um, explored. He was a geologist and he explored and dug it for many years and found most of the cave. And uh, I was quite close to Willie. And um, when he couldn't cave anymore, he was uh, sadly terminally ill. And um, we started to dig in there, which he sort of approved of. And the dig went on from uh, 2008 to 2012. Um, People say, well, where would you dig? It's a lot of luck, but also you look at, um, is there a draft coming out of the passage? The passages would have been blocked by um, flood water, you know, a few thousand years ago when there was probably a massive river coming down Cheddar Gorge. Um, So... We were digging a small passage, um, I would say about uh, half a metre by half a metre. Um, You can also tell by some of the scalloping, uh, just like scalloping on the wall. So if they're big scallops, the water flowed slowly. If they're very small ones, it flowed fast. We had small scalloping and a bit of a draft. And we were digging and digging for four years. And in um, 2010, um, sorry, 2012, um, we got to a point where the rubble that we were taking out, the rocks we were taking out, we were running out of places to stack them. So it was getting a bit like, you know, a World War II escape from Colditz film, you know. (laughs) Where were we taking? The further back, you know, the more effort is putting rubble and sand and gravel in bags. And one day we had this very small breakthrough and um, we found probably 50, 60 metres of passage. But again, it was all quite low. And we went back the next week and said, if this still stays low, we're, we're giving up. Because although it was quite wide... What, what do you mean by low, sorry? Well, it's probably going down to below half a metre in height. Okay. So we're flat out. Yeah. And um, 
But we went back the following week and uh, a friend in front moved another small boulder rock out the way. So it was getting bigger. And uh, it got bigger and it became walking height. And then we entered a chamber that was, um, I think, 25 metres high. Wow. And at the end was a boulder slope. Now, remember, this is in just off Cheddar Gorge, halfway up Cheddar Gorge on the right. And um, a boulder slope, and one of the other team went up the boulder slope. That's a slope of boulders. Um, and at the top, she looked down, and it was just a big black hole. Wow. And um, we had some friends who two of the key diggers with us. It was mainly six of us and other people helped and joined, but there's mainly six of us. Two of them were on holiday in um, Iceland. And so I'd said, we can't go down that, the drop. As it turned out, the drop was about a, uh, what was it, a 12-meter pitch. A pitch is where we need to take ladders or ropes to get down it. And uh, one of the girls, she said, I've got two ladders in my car. You know, I'll go back and get, no, 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 no. We're about an hour from the entrance. So we have to wait for the other two. So we waited for them to come back from um, Iceland. We went down this ladder pitch, and um, it opened out into a massive chamber, which by area, um, it was measured with the electronic equipment. By area, it's the largest known chamber in the British Isles. Wow. wow. Um, the largest one by volume, I have to say, is in a cave called Gaping Gill in Yorkshire. And... Um, that's bigger by volume, mm-hmm. but by area, the one at Reservoir Hole. It takes about an hour to go around. And hundreds and thousands of people have driven past that and seen <laughs> it, you know, and walked across the top of it. I've walked across the top, and we never knew we were going to find that. And to get there, you've got about probably 100 metres of either hands and knees crawling or a bit of flat-out crawling, and suddenly you enter this big chamber. Wow. And, uh, in, we have, you've all heard of stalactites and stalagmites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so when they join together, they called a column or a pillar, and um, that has the tallest column or pillar currently known in the UK. I always say currently known because somebody may. Yeah. Of course, there's people you know, going to be digging elsewhere. Else. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. How and did it feel? It's quite exciting. Yeah, I mean, it it was. I always say the week before. Um, when we said we wait for our two friends to come yeah, back, yeah. it was a bit like when you were a kid waiting to, for Christmas Just Day yeah, to yeah. come along. And what I'd done, because you know, of sort of the age that I am or the age the others were, I text them, but I did it like a telegram. You two are probably too young to remember what a telegram no, was. No, I'm not. <laughs> Thank you, but I'm not. But you know, they used to have dot. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was sort of dot Titanic sank last night. Dot <laughs> yeah. stop, and they write stop, not dot stop. And so I sent them a text in Iceland saying, reservoir hole gone, which is what we would say. Reservoir hole gone. And I wrote the word stop. Take first steam package boat back to Blighty, stop. (laughs) And they came back and said, what's happened? What's happened? We're in a puffin restaurant. (laughs) Why though? I always remember that. We're in a puffin restaurant. You're eating puff. I was more concerned about the puffins. Yeah. And... um, I just said, um, big, a big hole, because we didn't know if it, we couldn't see around a corner, so all we could see was this um, going off into the distance. We couldn't see, because to us it looked like a, what we would call a passage. Mm-hmm. But when we got down there and into it, it was a chamber that opened up. Um, the height of it, of it at one point is 47 metres. Wow. From the floor to the roof. So, uh, yeah, it's a big passage. So that's what I did. So I kept sending these things with the word stop, really. <laughs> <laughs> Blighty. But they came back and we went down and, yeah, the rest is history. So because it's on land or the entrance is on land owned by um, Longleat Estates, yeah. um, so straight away we spoke to them down at Cheddar Caves and uh, because, you know, it's good for them for some publicity. And uh, that, I think it was the following night they wanted us up there and they did, there was ITV did a, broadcast from um, the weatherman and in his van up there and then somebody else then we had Radio 4 on and um, yeah it went from there then the one show did something um, where we took somebody in um, who had done some caving she's a local um, journalist who they work with and so the one show did something and the idea was of course the BBC 
gets even worse now with things going on with the BBC. But at the time, I think um, they'd recently had the Blue Peter thing where they couldn't sort of mock up a surprise. So they asked us beforehand, because it was a caver that had borrowed this £15,000. It's a thing called a LiDAR machine, which works out. You could put it here, and it would tell you the volume of the whole house, yeah, of this yeah. room by um, uh, every nook and cranny. And um, they'd said, do you mind if the person who's done it doesn't tell you until we do the broadcast? And so they took in a, an iPad into the cave, which won't work, no. the cave, <laughs> and filmed, you know, will it, you know, we're going to tell you which is the biggest gaping hill in Yorkshire. Or for us. And, of course, they used the area because we were bigger. Reservoir Hall was bigger. We called the, called the uh, chamber the Frozen Deep. Frozen Why? Deep. Because when we started digging, cavers, um, cavers sort of uh, look at different things when they're digging caves. So I was digging a cave in South Wales, probably a good example, in 1982, the Falklands Wall. So we had Falklands Pot that we found, right, yeah. Gautieri's Grovel. So people do different things. If you come across them with obscure names, they've probably been named by students, perhaps when they're taking Doing a few of something illegal taken, yeah. <laughs> or bands they'd heard of. Yeah. And um, because we were all a bit older, it was um, uh, Charles Dickens' birthday or 200th anniversary or something. I can't quite remember what it was. And so we've got hard times in the cave and we've got different things named. Somebody found this obscure short story he wrote called The Frozen Deep. And when we were at the top of this pitch, this tr drop to go down, we could see on the left-hand wall these massive white formations, just what we call flowstone, flow down yeah, the wall, yeah. all made of calcite, glistening. The, the lights could pick this up and, of course, The Frozen Deep. Wow. I've never read the book. I think it's hard to get <laughs> hold of it. It's probably was published in the London Gazette in... 18-something. So, Did does that answer your question? It does, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Went on a bit, but... <laughs> what, what an interesting story. It's amazing. I'm fascinated, yeah. really. My husband used to cave quite a bit when he was younger. Oh, right. And he was... I mean, he's part of the Scouts and stuff like that and all of that stuff. But then he... He went up north and caved up north and various other bits and pieces. He loved it. Absolutely. I can't think of anything worse, though. I think... You either like it or you don't. Yeah. I started with the Scouts. Oh, did you? Oh, that's yeah. funny. In 1970, and I remember reading Know the Game Potholing. I think that's a book. I don't know where you get those. It used to be Know the Game Everything. It was Know the Game, Learn Now to Fly Light Aircraft and Golf. And <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> how, to, you know, how to make a nuclear bomb, Know the Game. It was a little leaflet book that you could get. I remember reading that, and it was showing you, you know, the way you progress. You know, you're sort of walking passage, you walk. Stooping passage, you stoop. Try not to crawl unless you have to. And I remember seeing this book and thinking, the last two, when it had them on hands and knees and then flat out, I won't do that. I won't do that as a 14-year-old. Of course, the first cave people take you into, you end up doing the flat out bit. You think, oh, it's not that bad. Yeah. So, but I just saying that makes my heart race. <laughs> yeah. But I, you do get big caves like the one that we found. Yeah, but I so. couldn't get to it by, cause I couldn't get my because hands I couldn't get Because of the knees. low bits. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. do that. But you do have other caves where there's no low bits, you know, on the yep. Mendips GB cave, um, which was called GB cave after the two discoverers, both their surname, but also it was found in the, the late 1940s, so there was a bit of the war was on, so there was a bit yep. of patriotism there. Um, there's really no crawling, again, into quite a big chamber. And is it um, all dark? Yeah, it's always dark. It's the only place you get absolute Complete darkness. darkness. Yeah, if you turn... Turn off all your lights. You always oh. do that with kids and things. Teenagers love that. Put your hand in front of your face. Yeah. yeah. So they, they like that. Have you caved? Uh, yeah, with, with, with the scouts as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I never really enjoyed it that much. Yeah, it's always, we start with that. Of course, it's the only sport. A, a lot of cavers do a bit of, like I do a bit of walking, or we do mountain walking, and we go out in the winter, you know, in the snow and stuff mountains with ice axes or whatever so we, you do a little bit and some climbers do a little bit of caving you tend to stick to, stick to your sport the thing with caving or potholing um, is that if you're digging and looking for new caves you it's the only thing particularly in the UK where you could find something where nobody's ever seen or ever been yeah. and you think of somewhere like Cheddar Gorge um, those millions and millions of people all those years that have done that if only Goff, who opened Goff's cave, yeah. had entered that chamber, you know, he, you know, he'd have probably made even more money. Um, but um, you know, 
things are different, but I, I came back from one of our trips. Um, I think we'd found the frozen deep, and it was about the third trip, I think. And um, in the morning, I think it was on Radio 4, they had um, uh, a guy who worked for NASA, and they also had Richard Branson. And so it had been about 2012, when we, it would have been when we found it. And um, Branson was talking about he invested so many millions on the bathosphere to go to the Mariana Trench, and nobody had been there since Picard in 1961, 62. The date's wrong. Um, but he'd put all this money in, they're going to go down, and this other guy in the bathosphere to the deepest part of the ocean. And they had the NASA guy who was talking about going to Mars, and he said, well, it's going to cost so many trillion, and we hope to be there in 30 years' time to Mars. And then they both said... Really, these two places are the only place that man now can go that hasn't been explored, outer space or the deep ocean. So I sent an email to the BBC and said, well, I just thought I'd let you know, last night I was exploring a brand new big chamber cave that we found on the Mendips. Um, less people so far have visited it than stood on the moon. Um, and it cost me 50p roughly in petrol in my old Land Rover to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm ham, egg and chips and a glass of red wine. So, you know, let's get this correct, you know, two miles from where I live. And it can happen. Yeah, yeah of course. And, and do you think there's still more to explore and find? There is. I mean, if you look at, um, you get some anomalies. South Wales is a fairly well, very big limestone area. And it's an area that's been explored, but really only from the 1960s, because mo the big caving clubs were over here on the Mendips. And before the bridge was built, you had to get the ferry across. <laughs> <laughs> and so they've recently been discovered. So, I mean, if I said to you in the last 30 years, there's probably been 100 miles of big caves found in South Wales, wow. which is amazing. Um, and a couple of them are, are some of the biggest in Britain. So we're talking caves of 40-plus miles long. Blimey. So there's two caves that probably cover 80, 80 miles of passage in those 30 years, and then a couple of others that may have a few miles here. And, but to give you an idea, the longest cave on Mendips is about uh, four and a half miles long. Yeah, so, so, yeah, huge difference. Yeah. You'll notice, because of my age, I'll swap between metric and imperial. So <laughs> anybody who's watching. So, okay. <laughs> Out of interest, how old are you? 67. Right, okay. But I, I think Until next month. Until next <laughs> month. <laughs> people don't always recognise that you can still be doing what you're doing at 67 and actually feel that they're not able to do that, whereas you're obviously quite capable of... Yeah, I mean, I sometimes cave with two friends. Probably wouldn't like me saying it. One's early 70s. Yeah. The other one's 80 next month. Yeah. Wow. And he will still do some quite hard caving. Yeah. Um, and I read in the Sunday Times at the weekend, it was about uh, two British climbers, one of them quite famous. He, he was the guy that had to cut the rope on Joe Simpson that, uh, in the Andes that time. He wrote the book, um, The Void, Beyond the Void. Yeah, Beyond yeah. the Void. And um, he had an act, he's fallen 300 feet, the guy who did that, who cut the rope. Yeah. And him and his mate got him down. It said his mate was 71, I think, 72, with a colostomy bag. Gosh. And the guy that uh, fell was late 60s. Yeah. Said, Good for you. They're in, yeah. they're in the middle of nowhere in yeah. the Himalayas yeah. doing a route that nobody else had done. So, yeah, you get, you keep your health and keep fit. So. But is it also mind over matter as well? Because, you know, I'm straight away going, oh, I can't do that. What, caving? Yeah. Um, not really. I don't think so. I think it's something if people enjoy. I think the other thing with it as well is that you get caves that are horizontal. Yeah. You get potholes that are vertical. So if people, so particularly on the Mendips, we're more horizontal. You go to Yorkshire, the caves and potholes are more vertical. Yeah. Because of the way the limestone is. If you go to South Wales, all those caves that I've just mentioned, those long caves, um, are very, very few drops. Again, they, are, they tend to be these big river passages. Um, so again, I think it depends what you want to do. A lot of cavers, I know uh, cavers who have cut their teeth on British caving who now only do expeditions abroad. Yeah. So the Brits 
um, we've probably hired under a bushel a bit. We, we probably do more expeditions and find more stuff abroad than anybody else. So um, in Vietnam, it was British cavers that um, found some big caves, or oh, probably must be 20 years ago now. Um, one of them has been turned into quite a big um, attraction, an adventure attraction for tourists. So we're not talking about something that's 10 or 20 or 50 dollars to go in. You're talking they're pay the people are paying, you know, hundreds of dollars. Blimey! Um, so there's a two mile march in, and they walk through this cave that's got skylights shining light in, um, beautiful formations. They camp in the cave, but because it's all walking, um, or virtually all walking, um, tourists can do it, and they get. Um, you know, some high people who are spending a lot of money um, to do it, they, they limit the numbers. But I was talking to somebody who was just there recently, in fact, had dinner with him on some Monday night, and he was saying that um, there's hundreds of people now employed because those sort of people with the, with the disposable income, they want a four- or five-star hotel to stay in before they do the rough trip. And so, you know, everything associated with um, taking small groups of people in there and so that's quite exciting because it's not, you know, everybody turning up, paying their $10, buying a postcard, going in a show cave that you get all over the, you know, the world. Um, it, it is, at the moment, obviously, for people who've got the money to buy, pay for it, but it's really helping the Vietnamese um, economy. And they are looking at developing the area. So as far as the scenery and perhaps having caves that you can go in for a couple of hours and be shown around and come out. So it's becoming like a, you know, a big bit of tourism, really. It's very big for them, yeah. yeah. And that, that's happened everywhere. So, yeah, so you do get people that, um, you know, look and, and do those sort of things. So, yeah, we have British cavers that probably don't do anything in Britain anymore, you know. Really, they just go off and abroad <laughs> yeah. and, and do things, yeah. So what will they do with the one in Cheddar Gorge? Are they just going to leave it where it is? I, I kind of know where it is because I just do... I don't know why I know where it is, but I just do. But what are they well, going Well, it's to called do Reservoir it? Hole yeah. because it's by... Let's hope they leave it as it is. Right. Is that what you're... We would like. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's halfway up the gorge. Um, it's quite difficult to get to the chamber. Um, and, of course, if you open that up, I would suggest that lower down the gorge... The tourists wouldn't, you know, if there was a choice to go and see two different things, they wouldn't do that. So perhaps after all the investment, um, it wouldn't be worthwhile. Whereas at Wookie Hole, they opened up another chamber a few years ago called Chamber 20. Um, but that's all part of the Wookie Hole trip. So you're still doing the old part yeah. of Wookie Hole Cave. Back in the early 70s, um, the tourist trip, the show cave finished in Chamber 3. And then in the 70s, a tunnel was blasted. Um, over the top so, so people could see Chamber 9. Um, and then recently, because we knew where Chamber 20 was, um, it doesn't. you don't go through 19 chambers or whatever to get there. It's just the way that the divers of the time um, numbered them. But they, they blasted a tunnel which took people into Chamber 20, which is quite impressive. It's got some really interesting rock formations. It's got a lake in there. And before that, to get there, it was a 500-foot scuba dive blimey underwater um dropped down to 70 feet and then came up the other side and then you put your kit on the side and uh, wander around and explore it and so uh, so i think there's different things with reservoir hole it, it would be a shame in my own opinion but i don't own it yeah <laughs> and that's the thing because so you don't get much of a choice either do you do they do they listen to your views on it or some show cave owners are um better to talk to than others hopefully Longleat will see the advantages that um, places like Wookie Hole have had from publicity from cavers particularly where there's been um, where we've done training in the caves and you know we have had we've done training in Goff's cave uh, for cave rescues and things um, and we do um, at Wookie Hole so we hope that Longleat um, will you know see the Bennett yeah we'll leave so coming to cave rescues, done many? A few over the years, yeah. We probably have at the moment between, not that many, maybe between four and six a year. Um, but um, we have, most of those are normally um, simple accidents. Every few years we do get a big one. Um, 
and if we get that we sometimes we look after the mendip hills yeah um and though we're mendip cave rescue we also look after the way it's split we look after all of somerset all of dorset and half of wiltshire where the, the there's the box stone mines mm -hmm. so if you go over to box um, there's stone mines there all the stone for bath came out of and um some of those old mines are well, miles and miles long, right. 10 miles long. Even people say some of them are 40 or 50 miles long, but they're quite complicated. So we look after rescues there as well. So we have between, I would think, four and half a dozen cave rescues a year. Um, Mendip Cave Rescue is the second oldest rescue team in the country. Wow. Um, Who's the first? That's the CRO, which is the um, Cave Rescue Organisation, okay. based up in Yorkshire. Yeah. They were formed in 1935. We were formed in 1936. <laughs> and what's interesting, um, and I always talk about this when I do talks, is that we all hear of accidents on the mountains. We all hear of mountain rescue. We hear of Exmoor rescue. And you know, I know from, from colleagues who are in the Lake District and, and North Wales, to give you an idea, some of the mountain rescue teams in those areas are going out 360 rescues a year. Wow, really? That many? They get that many. So they get a lot in the Lake District, um, and they do up in North Wales around Lamberis. But when you look at it, um, the mountain rescue teams really only started in the middle of the Second World War with the RAF. Who, it was a guy in the RAF who actually started Mountain Rescue because they were doing a lot of training in, you know, they couldn't really train in the southeast because the war was going on. So airfields had aircraft for training up in Scotland and North Wales and places where there's a lot of mountains. Very sadly, some of the aircraft were coming down and the RAF started the Mount, RAF Mountain Rescue Team that still operates in some areas and still rescues walkers. Um, and it wasn't until, I think... The late 1950s, one or two mountain rescue teams started. But if you know somewhere like Lamberis in North Wales, mm -hmm. you know, Lamberis is one of the busiest mountain rescue teams around. Um, you know, they cover Snowdon. I believe they weren't formed until 1971. What? So prior to that. So it's really odd it's that, cave, it, yeah, that yeah. cave rescue sort of got going and, and started off. So... Um, but so that's saying that, um, so abroad, because obviously, aren't you, I mean, do people ask for advice abroad or do you come, become part of anything internationally or is it? Yeah, we are part of, so Mendip, little old Mendip Cave Rescue. We're part of um, the British Cave Rescue Association. Yeah. And we're all affiliated with all parts of Mountain Rescue England and Wales. Yeah. There's a sort of body that doesn't control caving, but... You know, we, we sort of report with them as well. Yeah. We occasionally have had big rescues um, overseas where um, they've asked for help. Yeah. Um, it's normally been diving. Cave, cave diving is something that um, it's very specialist. Mm -hmm. A few people do it around the world. The cave diving group in the UK is the oldest. Um, it's actually, I believe, the oldest um, diving club in the world. Uh, we were formed in... 1936 no sorry we were formed in 1946 um, the first cave dives in the world were at Wookie Hole in 1930s which yeah. is why I was getting confused with the dates um, and Graham Bolcom um, who formed the cave diving group did the first cave dive um, wearing hard hat brass helmets <laughs> weighted boots two gentlemen on a I always think it's made of mahogany. It's probably made of cherry, a large box where they slowly turn the handle to pump the air to him. Right. And he did the first dive. And what a lot of people don't realise was that the person who did the second dive with him was a lady called Mossy Powell. And she very sadly died in the 1960s. Um, but she was incredible, if you read about her. And... Um, She's just been nominated, and I've had to write a letter for the um, international. F I think it was the International Federation of um, Female Divers to be in their honorary awards. Yeah, yeah. And it's only recently people have learnt about her. Apart from cavers, we all knew of Mossy Powell. Yeah. And so when people think, "Oh, you know, caving's 
perhaps those years ago was a man's sport and everything. If you read any of her logs, quite interesting that she actually mentions, um, oh, uh, three of the married men. There was only about <laughs> six or seven of them. Three of the married men had to go home. And then later on with the diving at Wookie Hole, where there was sometimes been taking all this kit in. It was still a show cave there. It was yeah. a show cave then. But they were taking the kit in, and she says, oh, um, just four of us left. Um, you know, um, four of the or three of the married men couldn't weren't given <laughs> weren't, weren't given the night off this time. <laughs> she was quite an independent lady. Yeah, she's really really interesting. The name rings a bell for me for some reason, but I don't know yeah, why. Penelope it's Power was her name. Right. Um, became Mossy, but um, yeah, lived out in I think in Singapore. Had got married, had children, got divorced, um, came back. All very independent in the early thirties. Yeah, yeah. Got a job as a guide at Wookie Hole. Worked wow. in the CAF and went, I'm interested in the diving. And if you read anything that Graham Bolcom said, and I knew Graham Bolcom, um, he died in 2000, but I, I knew him from when I was 16. So I'd known him for quite a long time because he lived in Hertfordshire, where I originally came from. Right. And, um, but he always spoke and in the log very fondly of her saying, you know, she was the best, she was the lead. She was always there. She was always carrying things. And there's great photographs of her in the suit before because her nose like a cartoon comes up to there before they put this big brass helmet on oh. <laughs> and because uh, she was small she's very petite when you see pictures she had the typical what i is it a bob very 19 yes. sort of 20s 30s bob yeah so okay you know females have been caving so okay so you have somebody that you're going to take down a cave and they've never done it before as such and you get in there and they start having a panic attack you just turn around and come out because they're probably going to have the panic attack within the first few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the decision. Yeah. And have you ever had a, has there ever been a time where you've been, I guess scared is probably the word to use. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You get that. There's been times perhaps when we've gone somewhere in the, because um, you get wet, ca I was saying, you get all different caves, tight caves, narrow caves, big caves, wet caves, dry caves. Wet caves are ones we call active. Dry caves are the ones that have been formed and the water's disappeared somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I've been in active caves where perhaps the water's coming up and it's a bit, or you're in there and you get a bit worried about, you know, with the water, with the weather, did we make sure that was, you know, because it can be very variable, you know, even on the Mendips. But... Um, because that's when yeah. you hear about all these things, isn't it? You hear, you hear about cavers and people like that do that when there's been a disaster or somebody's trapped or or if somebody's dog's trapped and for some reason you spend hours and hours and hours looking yeah occasionally we do we do dogs and help cows before yeah sl slid down the back of some of the houses in the bottom of cheddar gorge the, the shops where they've only got they've got a really small gap and somehow a cow went down there once which is quite interesting trying to get it out but um yeah i mean the main thing with with rescue and you know we were asking me about anything international it, it's been British, and we got on to diving, but, you know, it's been British divers um, that have been called out um, because we seem to be expertise in it. Yeah. Um, and they get called out via the Foreign Office. Um, and sadly, they've, they've been out um, and found bodies um, of other... Normally, people they know, because it's quite a small yeah. part of the sport worldwide... Um, that have gone into caves, even in France, that have some of the best cavers, the best climbers, the best divers in the world. Um, one of their lead divers a few years ago um, went missing, and they had nobody that could go and look at it apart from the British. And so the French sent over a military and flew them over, and you know, sadly, our two found them and brought them out. And that was the same with the Thai rescue um, of the soccer boys. Yeah. Mm. Remember that? Um, that um, the seven divers there. The six were British and one was the Australian doctor um, that was with them. But it was the Brits that were first called out to help. Um, so they've even helped many years ago. Caving friends who are still in the army don't like this being told, but there was a, what they call a joint expedition to Mexico. So when they have it, so they get the Navy, the RAF and the army, and there was some SAS people in. The cave flooded. We had to take over our divers. <laughs> people always laugh, you know, who were in their 50s. You know, <laughs> go over, go in. And it was a very, sh fairly short, easy, um, what we call a sump flooded passage that had come up. 
And so they just took them in. A lot of them could dive anyway, you know, being the Navy guys and that. So they just taught them, put some equipment on them and brought them through. And the visibility, I think, was quite good. But, um, you know, the feat of what happened with, with the Thailand thing, um, you know, it was amazing, really, because, again, there was a lot of people there. Um, America had sent out Navy SEALs, and, uh, you know, I hear stories from the, the six guys that went this. It was quite funny. They've got these Navy SEALs there all, you know, sitting in the hotel, all pumped up, you know, waiting to be asked. And we've got our guys who were middle-aged there going, well, this is what we're going to be doing, because they, they, they did it all. They just took control and, and made it happen. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of politics and that being in, you know, Thailand and the way things operate. Um but occasionally, so earlier this this year, oh, last month, um, there was an American um, caver who's a doctor who was on an expedition. It's about the third or fourth time he'd been there into Turkey, um, right up in the mountains. And he was down at 1,000 metres, which is pretty deep for caves. And um, he had, apparently he knew of it, and I suppose being a doctor, he was controlling it. But I believe he had a um, a burst ulcer. And it took about, f I think, five, six days to get him out. Um, it's a very awkward, very tight cave, lots of vertical drops. But in that situation, we were put on um, standby through the British Cave Rescue Council. So they contacted me early on and said, you know, have you got... Um, you know, can you have on standby? We want um, four people that are good at what we call rigging, so sorting out all the ropes yeah. and that to get the stretcher up, and we need um, three medics. And so we had seven people standing by, and then we were all at a friend's, some cavers, friends up on Mendip at a, a wedding. Uh, they got married on the Friday, so there was a big reception in the marquee in a farmer's field and free mm -hmm. beer and food on the Saturday night. And um, I'd had to brief two of them, that it looks like they wanted the people who could do rigging, particularly. They were, the guy was moving out. Um, we've been contacted by the Foreign Office, who've been contacted by the Turkish government. And so, you know, you may be flying out in probably Tuesday, and this is on a Saturday night, you know, so... And they wanted to take some of our equipment out. That's what happens. The same thing happened in Thailand. So you know, we have certain radios that we could send out or equipment. And then on the Monday, we were stood down um, because they were making such good progress to get them out but that was international so that was mainly Italian um, Hungarian cavers some French cavers um, that were helping so occasionally you get that but and, and, and who pays for all of this so you know you, talk, you talked about <coughs> equipment and you know, having these people on standby you know are, they, are these are these people are these roles paid um, well do they have full-time jobs how do they get time yeah. off work all of that so, kind of stuff yeah it, it's it's a it's, it's a thing I try and shout from the rooftops. Um, in the UK, I can't speak for what goes on overseas, but in the UK, the saying is, cavers pay for cavers. Um, I obviously understand that if somebody's injured and then they have to go to hospital, they appreciate that, that's, but that's the same for anybody. You know, you can't say, well, they're taking up an NHS bed because they were caving, but so is somebody who smokes 50 cigarettes a day. Yeah. So does somebody who's totally overweight. So, you know, that's... Um, but cavers rescue cavers, and the November before last, uh, we had, so come up two years ago, um, a friend of mine had a very nasty accident in a big cave called Ogolfin and V, Cave of the Black Spring in South Wales, which is over 40 miles long, and uh, he was so seriously injured, we couldn't bring him out the entrance he'd gone in, because it was very narrow and tight, and um, the whole rescue took 52 hours, um, there were 450 cavers there from all over Britain. Wow. Um, I was driving back. To, we'd went on holiday somewhere, but I was driving back we were on the M5 um, Saturday late afternoon. I got a phone call. Can you have a team standing by ready to go tomorrow? Um, it's looking bad. We all went over, and everybody mixed in. And apart from uh, one policeman who was there, because we all get called out and we're insured via the police, um, and then later on, some uh, paramedics who turned up because we needed more oxygen. That's cavers doing that, and you ask if they've got jobs. They have, and I have known on previous ones where people have phoned in sick on the Monday, and uh, suddenly their boss sees them on the telly <laughs> coming out of a <laughs> cave, 
Um, and that happens, and people don't believe it. And even with the Thai rescue, we wouldn't... I did the PR for that back here, a lot of the PR, not all of it. Um, so it was radio and TV stuff. And, you know, what's the names of these people they're from? I, I can't give you the names because the ones in their 50s, I knew, you know, one of them worked for himself, one was retired, uh, the other one worked for himself. But we had two of the younger ones were there um, in their 30s and one in his late 20s. I didn't know what he'd told his boss, but we asked him to fly out. And you know, it was on a Sunday. Can you, you need to be at Heathrow tomorrow night on a Monday because you're going out to Thailand for however long. So we couldn't give names because I don't know what he'd told his boss. Yeah, As yeah. it was, course, yeah. he had told him, and they'd said, "Of course, of course, you can go." So, um, but yeah, we had that. So that was November before last. Uh, we got him out successfully, and I spoke to him the other week, last Tuesday, I think. Um, He's mending. He's doing a little bit of caving now, but uh, he has some severe injuries. Wow. The biggest thing with cave rescue that's so different to other stuff, if you get an accident on a mountain, unless there's a storm or the clouds down, you're there probably for a couple of hours. Mountain rescue, get there. Helicopter comes in and takes you off. What you have to understand, so even on, I would say, little old summer, little old Mendip, you know, our caves aren't 40 miles long. Our longest cave is five miles Swilden's Hole is the longest one, and um, it's got a couple of sumps that you can dive. It's got a few sumps holding your breath, pull yourself along on a rope, and it's got some that you need an air bottle. If somebody had an accident, two fit guys in their 20s or 30s, one broke a leg at the end of Swilden's, if his mate really rushed out or her mate rushed out, they'd probably, if they're lucky, they'd be out of the cave within three and a half to four hours we would then need to get a team together. We need to use our doctor, our paramedics who are divers because they need to dive in. So yeah. that narrows down the team I can call. That would probably take us, because of the diving and getting kit together, yeah. if we could do it quick, an hour on the surface. So we're now up to five hours. That would take them at least four because of the kit they're taking to get down there. So we're talking nine hours from the guy breaking his leg to somebody getting to him that from there would then probably take us 20 hours to get them out wow. if they were in a stretcher. That's, that's just phenomenal when you yeah. start thinking about so time scales. that's our time scales. We're very lucky in this country, and, and this applies to all of you that go walking in the mountains or do anything. We're the only country in the world where, and this comes back from my uh, saying to you about um, people in the mountains having 300 rescues a year, they didn't have the doctors or the paramedics that could be part of the team. They just weren't around. You know, it's a rural area, you know. Yeah. Um, there was one or two, but they couldn't be called out and everything. So people were often being given well, you know, a paracetamol or something and, you know, bandaged up your broken leg. And the British government a few years ago passed um, a law in Parliament where uh, there was a thing called the Casualty Care Certificate. It's the only one in the whole world, I've said that, but um, where you can be trained cave rescue and mountain rescuers can give you intermuscular morphine, adrenaline, and one or two other drugs, and, and fentanyl. And um, so we have about 12 of us that are trained up to do that. Uh, we have regular training. But that's a big, big advantage, particularly... Pre presumably that's simply because of the length of time it takes to, to get back to the patient. Yeah, I mean, we have some good caving doctors. Um, we have yeah. caving doctors that could get down to, you know, the end of Swilton's. Um, well, we've got one uh, <laughs> who could do that. But we've got paramedics. But we have a lot more people that have the casualty care course, like I have. As I said, it, if anybody listening or watching, it's probably more important to them if they're walking in the hills. Mm. Because now, if you're out in the Lake District or Snowden, you have an accident, um, you know, one of them can at least give you pain relief and, and things. So uh, that's been a big step forward for us. Um, no other country has that. Wow. It's brilliant. It, it's really good because it's also recognising that you've got the capacity to do it and the capabilities and giving you the recognition that you're capable. If you Because I think sometimes yeah. we're not... I mean, we deal with mental health all the time. Mm. The charity deals with that. And sometimes I don't think people see the severity of the work that we do and also the seriousness that goes with it, if you see what I'm saying, the responsibility that sits with that. Uh, and there's a level of complacency about... What sometimes, oh, yeah, it's only the cave rescue. 
you know what I mean? Or it's only yeah. somewhere house, or it's only this, or it's only that. But actual yeah. fact, it takes a hell of a commitment to do what you do. Yeah, and I do know, you know, very rarely, you know, if we've had a casual, a, 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 yeah. a death, um, we tend to make sure it's the older ones of us that, um, you deal know, go it. in and deal with that rather than the younger ones. The Mountain Rescue England and Wales are quite good at producing, um, you know, leaflets and courses and things on mental health yeah. for rescuers because they may have seen some pretty horrible you know, horrible yeah. stuff whereas we never really had that in the past um, and the good thing with the casualty I mean when I first started um, cave rescue the two in fact one of them I still dig with we started this conversation Dick and the contacts Peter I still dig with he's a retired doctor now but he'd have in the rescue store in the special safe for controlled drugs what he liked using and then Tony, who was the other doctor, he'd have in the same state, but what he liked using yeah. was pain relief. That was all different all across the country. I can go to any cave rescue store or any mountain rescue store and I might not be a member of the team, but if they were desperate and needed help, I can go in there and the drugs and all the paraphernalia they've got medically, I would recognise it and I could use it. And that is a big, big yeah. difference. Yeah. Um, and it's great if you have a big rescue like the one that we had, um, as it turned out, the one in South Wales, um, all the initial stuff that we were giving was things that the casualty carers could use until we got some of the caving doctors in there and then they realised actually how serious he was. So they were giving other drugs um, yeah. that, that they, as and the, I think we had four doctors there and then five doctors, paramedics, who got together who were cavers and saying, well, okay, we need to get this and we give that. And, you know, But all that initial, those first few urgent imperative hours it was the casualty carers that could say well you know we can give you this but do it for free of charge yeah and i uh, i had a i was in a situation on top of cheddar gorge where somebody wasn't very well and they needed some support and i actually knew that person and i called the police and so my day was spent up on cheddar gorge and i don't do heights either i get really bad vertigo oh, <laughs> so they shimmied me up the side of the cliff <laughs> <laughs> and to talk to this person I mean, you know, and there was every Tom, Dick and Harry there, but everybody else was being paid apart from the ma mountain rescue and myself because I was doing it because I care. And it is that bit. Sometimes mm. we don't, people don't realise the commitment. It's like us, really, for the charity. We, mm. we don't get paid to do this. We don't get paid to do anything that we do. Mm. I don't, no. I've never taken a penny from the charity in, in 12 years, but you, people don't think like that, do they? They don't. No, they don't. I mean... You know, I'd even go further than that, that it depends which um, police force you come under. Yeah. We, we come under um, Somerset and Avon, Avon and Somerset. And um, they're very, very good, and we work closely with them, yeah. as a lot of the other teams do. Um, and they're one of the ones that would pay us for um, any mileage, if we go to a rescue, or even for training, because training we advise them with, we're doing a, 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 like a con an organised big training session. Yeah because of the insurance but we never ever claim we will no, not claim no, no. we don't claim for anything um and neither do we i don't think i've, I've no, ne yeah. ever ever it's, ever it's great that they support you in that way by offering it so if there they, are people that are less fortunate that yeah. want to help people they can yeah. yeah and and if any of our team um in fact i said this to them when we had the big one in south wales where people were turning up if you've got a because it was 100 miles from cheddar yeah yeah <laughs> so I go there it's, it's a long way so no, it's, yeah so it's 200 miles um if they were turning up if they were losing you know some money we cavers raise money from cavers we don't yeah. have a lot but our, you know our cost of operations fairly small you know if people needed that help we would give that um and we would pay them um but nobody asks so people do it for the love and, of it yeah and it comes back to the first thing i said when you asked me about rescue Cavers rescue cavers, and that's our motto. Um, you know, we we pay for it. Yeah. Um, and it is love. I, I just I love that. I th you know, I, I've we've got a motto. I've always had it. You only keep what you have by giving it away. Mm. And if you share your knowledge and you share that with other people, then actually it will come back to you. It doesn't you don't always recognise that it's coming back to you, but it does. And it's such a. It, I think it's such a level of kindness. I know it's your sport. But there is a level of kindness that goes with that, and I think that's really nice. Yeah, and also it's a very small 
um, a fairly small sort of um, a collection of people. Yeah. And the thing I think that was kept me sticking with caving, one of the things was the friendship thing. Yeah. Because you get a real mix. You get a real mix of solicitors, doctors, students. I've caved with people for many years who I don't actually know what they do. <laughs> I cave with people who seem to go on expeditions and do stuff and they drive around an old car. I don't know how they get their money. Yeah. I assume they're not getting it illegally. But, you know, that's what cavers do. Um, you get the caving huts. There's about five caving huts, I think, on the Mendips where people stay. And when I used to live in Hertfordshire and come down, I'd, I'd come down on a Friday night and you meet people. And I always said, some of the people here, it seems to be like on the Sunday night, I think they're put away in a box. <laughs> and then Friday night, they're... Out out <laughs> but is your, I mean, I, I kind of, I mean, I don't know your circumstances, whether you're married or what your circumstances are. And, but I think, does your, if you do, do you have a partner? Just answer. I'm me. married. You're married. Okay. So does your wife cave? Not anymore, but she used to. She used yeah, to. Yeah, she'd do so a bit she of caving. Has a, she, you're like minded then. So yeah. she has an, a level of under, because otherwise, yeah. I'm sorry, if you were my husband, I think I'd probably be thinking, like, Moss. He did think, oh, he's had to go off. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, no. She's done some caving. Yeah. Um, and she's still quite interested in it. Right. So, so it doesn't create a... No, no. Uh, we don't have caving pictures. Um, I collect caving books and caving prints, old oh, prints, really? you know, from the 1700s, 1800s. So we don't have those in the living room or the bedroom. Where are they? Or two bedrooms, actually, we don't have them. <laughs> They're everywhere else. The living <laughs> dining room, <laughs> hallway, paintings Absolutely. that people have done. Um, but, yeah, she does a lot of, we do a lot of walking. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said, there's that sort of grey area between caving and that. Yeah, so, of course. Um, if I give Nicola a plug, that's her name. Um, yeah, over the years, we've done 214 um, peaks, the Wainwright peaks in the Lake yeah. District. We yep. did all them because her parents live up there. Just her dad now. Um, and for some bizarre reason, being a bloke, you know, you like to collect a list. We've also done um, all the um, high points of all the England and Wales counties. Wow. And there's a little thing you can put online. There's a little group. I didn't bother with me, but I put her on it. And I was quite surprised she was only the sixth female, this is a few years ago, wow. to have been to the highest point of every, every county top. People say, you're mad. Did you just drive around? I said, well, no. <laughs> we went to a wedding in Essex. Yeah, yeah. And said, so, well, we'll take it up for a few days. We'll go up to Norfolk, Suffolk. Some of them take two minutes. Some of them, like County Durham, you have to get, it's a firing range. You have to get a permission. permission and you have to book it and it's a slog across. And I took a picture at the top of all of them. The most dangerous one was Cambridge because the highest point of Cambridge is, the, is the, on a bend on an A road. And I took all the pictures of Nicola on the top, so it had to be, like, quickly rush out onto the bed. <laughs> I'll take a picture before this large lorry came round. Gosh. Well, that's a really cool thing to go and do. Yeah, and I was quite proud oh. that she was the, sort of the sixth person. It's really there. noisy in here today, isn't it? What's going on? <laughs> I'm just aware we've run out of time. And um, but, Yeah, we'd love to have you back. Can we have you back? <laughs> yeah, I know you've got yeah, you a want. lot more to talk about, which okay. we'd love to hear. Yeah, we would. I, ro I waffle on. No, you no, don't. no, it's, it's been, been fantastic. Really it, interesting. The hour has flown by. Yeah. So, tell you what, we could do. We could do a recording in a cave. If we've got small equipment. We definitely could do that. That would be very good I've fun. Done that with the BBC. Yeah. Um, I got a friend. So you might not be able to have me there. <laughs> it depends where it is. You could be well, outside we could, the cave. Yeah, what we could do again. I was going to say, it's, I'm, I'm absolutely. I just really have bad claustrophobia. So. Yeah. Okay, so Welcome let's plan that. We could probably even do something in the show cave of Wookie Hole. Well, that'd be cool because I know them, and we could go in when they're closed. Yeah, brilliant. When they, when they close, I mean, in Do the wind, it. in the winter, which we're coming into, they close at like three, um, and I think between Christmas and New Year or something. I think they open for the New Year, but like the week up to Christmas, they they have Santa there. I know, but just an idea. Or yeah, we could go love into to. A, be brilliant fun. Call it a wild cave. You stop recording. Sounds good. We're going to stop recording oh, now. Thanks yeah. very much. Okay, Thank right. you. <laughs>